All right, I'm good. Let's roll. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hoon here, your host. Back with another golf episode today, episode 16, I believe. Blake Jackson is here co-hosting. It's good to be back. It is good to be back. It's been too too long. It has been too long. Uh, but on the podcast today, uh, legendary golf writer. He's walked around Ireland, which baffles me to this day. Uh, but Tom Coyne on the podcast, author and professor, so written a bunch of books. Uh, the new one will come out next year, Golf Course Called America, uh, which we're definitely going to talk about. But Tom, really appreciate you joining us today. Guys, thanks so much for having me. What's up, Oklahoma? Yeah, it's good to be kind of back. Um, spent a little time there last year. But yeah, thanks for having me on. And and Mike, it's y- your accent. I can't quite play it if it's like Tulsa or Oklahoma. I guess you're in Oklahoma City. I didn't expect to get a Welshman when, when I checked in today. Ah, nice little surprise. It was a good surprise because we'll probably end up talking a little bit about Wales. Yeah. So I, I, the, for me, the first time I was aware of you, aware of the things that you've done, uh, I actually saw you on the No Laying Up Travel series. And yeah, that was – fun man the we did uh their tourist sauce in ireland so that was i i've known the guys for a little while um i've known dj the longest probably because we both kind of started with the golfers journal and you know and then got to know solly and randy and uh, so it was great when they you know said hey we're doing ireland and we'd like you to come sort of be our irish golf guy um having written a book about it and uh i'm glad i said yes because it was an absolute blast and not only that like a lot of people saw it so it's good for the brand as they say um definitely got uh more people exposed to to the books which was wonderful but it was also just grew that time in ireland with there's such good guys and there's such good friends which is um you know as someone in his 40s with two little kids i mean i have friends um <laughs> but i don't spend as much time nurturing those friendships as i do chasing my kids around probably a lot of guys can relate to that like this group of like brothers um and the way that they work together and divide and conquer and, and how well they've done they're easy to root for yeah definitely. yeah um so we we both done a little bit of research over well, we haven't done any work today. We've been researching you. Uh, so we're going to come with some different set of questions. Nice. But for me, like, I, I kind of want to know, like, you know, where do you get your start in golf? And then how do you tie that into writing and end up with the jobs that you have now? Yeah, it's it's been a very winding road, right? I, I There's no way I could have sort of planned it this way, um, which I suppose is um, not a unique a unique thing because it was a matter of you know i went to school i was an english major uh did a lot of writing in college uh went to graduate school uh to pursue a degree in fiction and uh, in fonts in, in fiction writing and while i was there i had to write a thesis that would either be a novel or a collection of stories and to that point in my life, I mean, I started golf when I was eight or nine years old at, you know, at my dad's club, right? And and I was a decent junior golfer, not quite college. Well, if I went to a little tiny college with no golfers there, I guess I could have played in college, but um, that's not how it worked out. But I was in, uh, decent enough, but I was a, a caddy and for, I don't know, 12 years from seventh grade through graduate school. And that um turned out to be the job changed my life even more than than writing did because this thesis this book that i wrote while i was in graduate school was about caddies um and a golf prodigy who was a caddy the book was called a gentleman's game and it was funny i was writing it just to like get my degree and get out of school and um my professors were like hey you should maybe try to do something with this and, you know got an agent got it published and got made into a movie um i was 24 so that was pretty crazy. It was, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, surreal is an, is an abused word, but I really had no frame of reference at that point. 
you know, I didn't know if I had really even had a career and here I am on a, on a movie set where some story I made up is actually happening with like Gary Sinise and other actors delivering lines that I wrote. So that was, it was pretty wild. Um, so that's how I kind of, you know, got into, and then the golf stuff that comes after that, because a gentleman's game was set, you know, at an, in, in golf and is, I guess, a golf novel, you know, that gave me opportunities to start writing for some of the magazines and sort of become a golf writer. I mean, I spent some time after that book trying to write non-golf books um, and not succeeding. And then I said, you know, why don't I try try another golf story? And and I've done another one and another one. And, you know, my fifth one will be coming out in um, in May. So it's been, so I'm an accidental golf writer, I guess. I mean, you know, I went to school not for sports journalism. I went to school for, for fiction writing. Um, it, you know, the tool of storytelling good writing uh, they're all the same really so um crossing over is not uh i don't think that heroic of a thing um but it's just fun i didn't set out to say well i want to combine golf and writing it just ended up being the only two things the two things that i was most passionate about and i was fortunate to have the chance to to keep going after them yeah talking about I mean, the, the the island the island book is awesome because you basically walked the entire coast of Ireland. I did. Who, who the hell would do that? Um, right. I, I think back on idiot. Uh, I could have, could have died, but I was younger then. didn't have children. Just, just a dog. Um, I was recently married, but the Ireland book, <clears throat> that was, a you know, the next, sort of big jump and i think in in my career after gentleman's game i did a book called paper tiger where i tried to play pro golf which was my transition into writing nonfiction stories where i was a main character and you might notice that i'm i don't want to ruin the book for people so i, I won't tell you that i'm not on the pga tour right now but um you probably figured it out of course called ireland i started to bring in what I, i've been doing for the last 10 years is, is golf and travel and and using golf as a way to see the world and so with ireland you know i i'd been going to ancestry um i don't know if the folks can't see but i'm uh you'd pick me out of a lineup as an irish dude big big ginger and uh we'd go back and, and on family trips and play the links courses here and there and i just fell in love with it it just felt like home very comfortable and my family's all from around county mayo and uh, I was planning a trip for some friends and looking at a golf map of Ireland and saying, you know, I want to take them back and show them all these places. The map of Ireland, though, it's ringed with golf holes, right? It's, it's surrounded by Lynx courses. And so the country started to look like one big giant golf course. So I said, let's go play it, right? That'd be something. So I pitched it to my pusher. And the hook would be that I would walk the whole way because when you, take, when you golf in Ireland, you don't take golf carts. You walk. Um, so I said, all right, I'll be... 50 feet away or the next tee will be five days of walking away, you know, 70 miles away. So I pitched him that idea. And it's funny, like in the, in, in this job, you come up with ideas and you, you send them to your agent and they pass them on to a publisher, a, a proposal for an idea. And you're kind of throwing things at the wall sometimes. And sometimes they hit and sometimes they don't. Um, and this one hit and they said, yeah, that sounds, yeah, go for it. And then you're like, Oh no. I have, I have to do this now. <laughs> I have to walk around Ireland. Let's go get a backpack. Um, so, but it ended up being the best part of the story, at least for me, from a writing standpoint, in that by walking it, rather than it just being, it was initially a kind of a gimmick. But it, it, it forced me to stop and really pause and take my time going around Ireland. It forced me to stop in towns where tourists don't stop where the buses go past, uh, you know, I had a 20 mile leash on me cause I was on foot. So I feel like I got to know Ireland, hopefully in a pretty authentic way. You know, I, I do get generally compliments from Irish people. So, um, and which is an awkward thing to write about someone else's country. Right. Um, so that's pretty gratifying when, when you'll hear from an Irishman or Irish woman that, yeah, you, you got us right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think you did it the right way too. Uh, because I've I've been to Ireland and family originally from Ireland have driven the roads and I think you did it the safest way because most of the roads are only as big as a sidewalk anyways. 
So, well, yeah, I mean, I go, yeah, I go back now and I, I'm driving, right? And sometimes I think, well, I'll think like, wow, I can't believe I walked on these roads um, and didn't get hit. But then I'm also like, man, I'd, I'd be safer, walk, especially when I'm driving, uh, you know, or on the wrong side of the road and the roads are, are um, literally medieval. You know, some yeah. of their ancient, <laughs> ancient goat paths or, or, or sheep paths or whatever. Some, some of them, I mean, it, let's not make Ireland sound like it's in, stuck in 1842, but um, I mean, they do have highways and stuff too, but uh, in the remote areas, um, there are some roads that uh, I still see in, in my sleep and my nightmares. Yeah, it's, there's, even, we had a really small little Skoda when I was driving through there and my wife was very happy that it was as small as it was because 100 kilometers is the speed limit. I mean, it's about 60 miles an hour, but some of those roads just through, can't really see around. You have a wall on one side, you have a hedge on the other. It's a little white knuckly, but it's, it's an experience too. But so speaking of walking, the, what was the furthest walk that you had in between the courses on your trip? Because I know some were a lot shorter than others, but what was your longest yeah. and then what were some kind of stories in between like things? Cause I know you, you said you were chucking out wedges at some point or what are yeah. some you lost along the way or you found along the way that you kind of highlight? The walk? <laughs> I lost the, um, pounds, uh, sanity, self-respect. No, I didn't lose self-respect. It was, there was some really the West coast and Northwest. Um, we're long there were some long and lonely walks and the, because those would be lesser populated areas of ireland you know it's basically it's the farther you get from dublin the capital city you know the 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 more sort of rural things get and so some of those walks between courses and getting out like so getting out to carn um which is my world and i've written a lot about it but it's super remote and it's out on the bell it's out in this place called bell mullet out on this peninsula and there's you know one road in one road out um no sh- no shortcuts and so that day like you know because you're on foot like i had to stop in the town at the start of the road walk in for a day play for a day walk back for a day stay in the town again like four days later in the same place and then walk from there so those walks were like 20 and then coming out of car were like 26 miles so basically a ma- walking a marathon with um you know a backpack which has a laptop in it my golf club strapped to a backpack uh and it's raining um so i've got my whole life on my shoulders uh it's cold and windy god i can't believe i did this i'm so soft now i'm such a like i won't play if it's less than 50 degrees or like who was i um so those were those were days where sure what kept me going but losing um there there were there were moments of desperation where i i would like you said i i i started with like 11 clubs and i finished with seven where i would just take a pitching wedge and just toss it into the into a farmer's field because i'm just like whatever i'll I, i can hit a knock down a nine iron you know I don't need a wedge. Um, and I just started shedding clubs. I shed my golf shoes on the first day. So I kept only one pair of shoes with me. I would lose just to even like lose like a t-shirt just made me feel a little bit lighter. Cause you're so acutely tuned to the weight on your shoulders. Um, so I just, and you know, it was cool though, man. I, I got look at some of those pictures and I'm like, damn, I need to walk around Ireland again. Otherwise I don't know how to lose weight. Otherwise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, are we muted? No. I think that's one of the, that's one of the things that is the most fascinating about the book, but especially some of the pictures that you included in it, just the, the image that I have of you that just kind of stands out the most is just walking. You can see the clubs on your back, wearing your rain gear, you've got your beanie on, you've got your rain on, and you're just, it looks like you're just holding on, but it's like, to me, you're just holding on for dear life, looking into the, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's one of the most fascinating reads, but just how I think you said it, I think you have to see the country in a much different light than 
I mean, especially me, I was there for 10 days. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play any golf, but the little, the little town, the little roads and the places like that, I think the things that I remember the most, just cause you, it's just something you don't see here. So I think, yeah, you yeah. first yourself in it as best as you possibly could. Yeah. I mean, it's all about getting off the beaten path, right? I mean, as a storyteller, as a golfer, you know, we want to play places never heard of and as a writer you want to tell stories that haven't been told and 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 so that that adventure you know it off the path the beaten path literally you know so um and, and some of those little towns or unexpected nine hole golf courses those are the most uh, rewarding moments for me and they're probably the moments that i hear most about from readers um as well as you know, as like, well, the, the, everyone wants to know how I'm married and how I'm still married. Um, cause my wife's a saint. Uh, how did I survive the walk? I mean, there was a moment out there on the road. I mean, yeah, I was holding on tight and I remember coming down through Dublin and it had rained for 30 days in a row. And, um, uh, so, I mean, everything, my whole life was just wet and I just got, I guess I got used to it, but I came, I was logging my mile and I came to a church with a bridge and just as I crossed the bridge I crossed a thousand miles on foot and uh and so I go into the I went into the church I'm not a particularly religious person but it was a very spiritual experience um to and it's just like an arbitrary thing like okay I just wanted to I just walked um but there was something that felt a little bit uh, miraculous about it just because it just was something that I can't imagine myself ever doing, you know? And so whether it be walking, golfing, whatever your pastime is, your interest is, you know, I just took it to a a very obsessive, maybe even unhealthy level. And and I've continued to do that with the books um, because the idea is come along on this adventure with me, right? You want to play golf in Ireland? I'll play all of it. You want to try and play pro golf? Here's what it's like. Do you want to play the links of Scotland? I played every one. And I do it with the America book too. I mean, so there's definitely some thing the road <clears throat> and this has only gotten better with social media because people can literally come with me almost you know but when i'm on the road i feel like friends and readers are with me as i go and i i can't i can't quit because that's what kind of story is that yeah with uh so with the new book um you know obviously you didn't walk around america but played a lot of golf eight months um you know 36 most days right uh, yeah, I think after doing the travel travel uh, tourist source with the No Laying Up guys, is that kind of what inspired you to do the next life your videos to see like to just bring people with you on another level? Yeah, I mean that inspired that trip inspired a lot of things. I mean the the Ireland the the America book was 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 happening. Um, we knew the next book was going to be golf in America and myself and, you know, my editor and agent, we were trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to approach it? And, uh, we were having dinner in, in Ireland and we were talking about how I was going to do this American trip. And, and so the, uh, the boys started playing, they, they tend to like to play like games of like rating or ranking things or comparing things. Like we were, everyone was like naming, a, a golf or or connecting every course we played to like a band and that that was always fun to do at dinner but they started playing this um best state worst state like what's your favorite state and what's your you know least favorite state and so as they're going through the list they have all these interesting it's it, this is actually in the book too and i didn't tell them that it's in the book yet but anyway um there's a few states they might not be welcome back into <laughs> no um But as they're going through the list, I'm thinking, I haven't been anywhere, you know? Um, I knew I wanted to go play every U.S. Open course because that would help me the history of golf in America. But after listening to them describe their experiences in in all these different states and what they liked about them, what they didn't like about them, I said, you know, I have to go see them all. Like, I want to do, I'm going to do all 50 states, Hawaii, Alaska, I'm going to do the whole thing and get this, you know, comprehensive picture of, and, or at least comprehensive in terms of golf. Um, So that they definitely inspired me that way. 
but yeah, seeing how they operated and how they filmed the shows and um, their whole MO and their logistics and their partnerships and all of that was a, was a really useful experience as well because I had this big adventure coming up and I wanted to share it with people. And what was the best way? I mean, they had sort of, they'd done tremendously well on YouTube. And, and so I partnered with some, some brands and um, a producer and a, a um, and, and a marketing team and, you know, it's life, which is on YouTube. Um, I think we did 12, 14 episodes of that around my travels. Um, and that was a, just a great way to engage with the community, right? Cause it's all about, I mean, the stories golf right now, I mean, that's the big word I think for what's young and interesting and happening and energetic about golf is community. It's, it's not, you know, when I was growing up, golf was associated with country club. Um, and now I think the bigger word and the more interesting word is now community and where that exists. It exists online, of course, but um, not exclusively at one or the other. Yeah. And that's, I think that's been the most unique thing, especially now is for a while there, people really couldn't access, couldn't access golf between COVID-19 and everything like that. It's, so I think the, the different mediums of uh, YouTube, Instagram, and um, things like the Golf Journal kind of help get that fix out and kind of keep that community going. And it's been really interesting to see. Um, so speaking of that, which, which medium be either writing YouTube, Instagram, podcasts that you do, uh, what do you find most interesting or most difficult way to tell a story? Hmm. Um, good question. I mean, my love, interest, passion, all comes from the the writing um it's all the you know there's something about the words on a page um printing out a story and holding it in your hands um looking at a manuscript seeing a book on the shelf all of that just hits all the buttons for me um and you know because because when i started doing this um you know, I was back in graduate school and, you know, we would meet authors who would come to campus with their books and you would just dream someday to have one, uh, someday to, I want to be like them. And, um, so I still, even though like the book writing process is, uh, it's not as immediately gratifying or maybe sexy as one would imagine it to be just it's a long process where you're, um, you know, you get a book deal, you're negotiating a book deal, you have an idea, you're, you write it up as a proposal, you start to write the chapters, you write the first draft, you send that off, you write the second, third, fourth, fifth draft, you, it's proofread, it's, it's edited, it's, you go so many, th through so many rounds and experiences with the book that by the time sometimes like it arrives, um, you're like, oh, I can't even open it. Like, I can't look at the pages anymore. because <laughs> you get to the point where I can almost recite. Um, I could probably recite a lot of my first book because I rewrote it so many times. I mean, there just seems to be like, and I, some people think as an author, you, you get to page 350 and you write the end and then you light a cigar and, uh, and you wait. You know, um, it's just not like that at, at all. Um, but it's still beautiful and wonderful. And that's, that's my love and the medium that, and I'm so glad for the golfers journal to come on because golf. Yeah. I mean, there's golf books, but you know, I can only get one of those out every three years if I'm really cooking. Right. But to be able to write for the golfers journal where we can write real stories and we can write long and we can write proper features, proper profiles. We can do interesting stuff. You know, they want stories. I should say we, since I'm uh, on the masthead, we weren't showing up anywhere else, which is a challenge as a writer, but it's also a really cool thing because it's like, okay, I don't just have to go out and write another story about is Tiger ready? You know, um, which I have no, well, I don't even know how, <laughs> I don't have access to Tiger anyway, um, but I'm not interested in telling that story. There's so many good stories around golf um, and the golfer's journal allows you to explore them. And then it adds this incredible photography to them. 
beautiful and then it puts them in a beautiful magazine and people hold it in their hands. So yeah, so the written word is still where it's at, but podcasts and Instagram and YouTube that that's can bring people to the books. They're all working together. You know, I don't think you can, you know, 15 years ago, you, you could just write your book and then sit around and hope for a royalty check, I suppose, or go to like do a book signing at a bookstore. It's funny, like when Gentleman's Game and even my, and, and my second book too, it was all about, man, I hope I can get some signings at bookstores. I, you couldn't get me to go to a bookstore for a signing now because, I mean, you could. I'd be happy to, of course, go to any bookstore out there, please. I'd, I'd love to. But the point being, your local independent shop. But even if I go to a bookstore here, I'll be lucky if, you know, there's a dozen people there. And if I, by doing a podcast, right, or going on YouTube or putting up an Instagram post that gets 4,000 likes, um, it's all changed, is, is I guess just what I'm trying to say about how you publicize a book now. So it's essential that you're in some way tied into social media and these other platforms because that's where this, that's where people are getting their news. That's where they're finding about out about the next thing they want to buy. Um, so it, I've been catching up with each book. Scotland was a little more social media savvy, but with a course called America, we had a full social media campaign plotted out and in terms of how much to post, when to post and what to post that, um, not that the stuff should feel staged or anything like that. It was just like, Hey, be mindful and use this to get readers. And, um, it's actually been super fun cause it's introduced me to a lot of cool people. And I got to, it's introduced me to like partners as well. Yeah. And I think like you played, it's just watching the, the links like videos, you know, people coming out to meet you on the golf course and like just meeting all these people you would never have without social media, then they're probably not going to see you. That was the coolest thing. I mean, to say, okay, I've got an open spot and I would, I did this a lot. Um, sometimes I did it well and responsibly and sometimes of like, all right, who wants to come play at Shenacoset, right? I, I've got, I've got a foursome and like 12 people would show uh, and we'd have to figure out how everyone was going to play off. But it was, that was always a good problem to have. Um, by the end of the trip, you know, it started off in Newport in Connecticut because that's where they had the first open. And I had like one friend playing with me. And then, you know, word, I guess, you know, starts to get around social media or whatever. Or more people are following it. And so by the end, you know, we had, you know, when I was in Los Angeles um, towards, towards the end of the trip and just threw out like, hey, you know, we're going to this Muni who wants to come and like 30 dudes show up. And, um, that is just, that's what I mean. That's the community, right? They're not showing up because I'm that cool or I'm that good at golf. And most of them wouldn't have read any of my books. It was just about being around other like-minded golfers or other like-minded people, people who were, I guess, kind of plugged into what was going on, who weren't pretentious, who had open minds, who were, and they weren't all millennials. Um, but they were just, uh, and you know, I guess if there was something I was representing was that golf is fun. Golf doesn't have to be stuffy and golf should be about people. So people who believe in that as well tended to like show up and just play golf with me. And that was just so amazing. I mean, dude, it happened in Montana. It happened in Alaska. It happened in Hawaii. Everywhere I went, I mean, there were courses where I'm like, there is no way anybody's going to play golf with me here. You know, I'll put it on Twitter that I'm going to be there tomorrow and I'm going to be alone. And three people would show up. You know, and, and that was, uh, that's really what the book ends up being about, uh, the people, uh, the, of a course called America. Yeah, I think, and that's, I mean, that just reminds me of what, uh, Eric Anders Lang has done with the whole random golf club. Yeah. Eric's a, a, a really good dude. And before I left, we had the chance to play, um, at Sleepy Hollow. It was the first time I played there. Um, he was in New York, and we've been trying to get together for golf. So we we played at Sleepy Hollow. He did a little video segment. I think I was at, I was promoting the Scotland book at the time, actually. Um, and he was cool enough to do that. But yeah, he's 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 really um, doing well with just hey, like come out and let's golf, right? And uh, and that's certainly something that I experienced on the road. And it's just a really, it's just a cool feeling of like, you know, the golf club and the country club 
it's a sort of long and not terribly complicated history, but it's a long history in America of how it sort of, sort of all comes to be and how country clubs are arranged here, because it's very different than in the UK where, or Scotland where the golf would have come from. I mean, certainly there are excu- exclusive clubs, but golf is an everyman's game. Um, the golf, the game itself is an exclusive. Yeah, the Royal and Ancient, that's exclusive. But the golf course across the street, not exclusive. So there's a different arrangement there. Um, golf comes to America and it becomes sort of guarded beca- behind gates and it becomes the things of country clubs because golf gains pretty here while the country is sort of going through all this change, all this immigration, all this new money, industrial revolution. And there's like a real fear of like, we're losing our old white Anglo-Saxon Protestant values. And we'll kind of, you know, we'll, we'll have these clubs, we'll play British sports and it'll be great. But that like had its purpose, I guess, but we stuck with it for a really long time and, 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 and continue to. So to see what what Eric's doing, random golf club, right? Where it's just, it's all about like the only requirement. And it was the same with people showing up to play with me. All you gotta do is love golf. You know, I don't even care. Uh, So stripping away, I think, I mean, full transparency, I belong to a private golf club because if you wanna play golf in Philadelphia on a regular basis, you kinda have to. Um, there's only a few public options and they just wouldn't be, uh, work for our, I don't have six hours to play on a Saturday morning. So, um, it's just something you have to do. And do I wish it was otherwise? And there were, you know, uh, more like a Scottish or Irish arrangement. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be pretty great. Yeah. And that's, I think it's so cool too. I think that's one thing that I'm most excited about reading in the book. I heard you, you talked about it, I think it was on Shane Bacon's podcast, just about the stories of putting it out there and the different people that you met. And I think you even put out a, all right, everybody with your iron covers and your your clickers for score, go ahead and put it off with Tom Coin. So do you, do you have any yeah. kind of some memorable experiences playing with just any random person in terms of like one that was – you were a little nervous about when you saw him, but it was pleasantly surprised or anything vice versa like that. Oh yeah. I mean, there were so many where like, so I'd been for a year emailing with people. Right. And so, I mean, the random show ups actually were almost disappointingly normal and nice people. Like I really wanted some freaks to show up and to totally either be awful or be awesome. Um, yeah i mean there was there was one dude that showed up who was like a he had like a grateful dead hat on and long hair and like was wearing sneakers and sloppy socks and like his shorts were falling off and weighed like buck 20 it was like seven feet tall and i'm like oh my god um this is gonna be a long day dude birdies the first four holes he's total stick just knocking down flags and i'm like this is awesome um and it just one of the themes of the book is i kept being reminded that all these things that I thought I knew about people, about America, about golf, uh, all my expectations continually were proven wrong. And, and that's the joy of it, right? That's the joy of travel and going out and see things for yourself. So, um, but for the most part, like people were like really nice and cool. Um, and, but there were, you know, I'd be emailing with folks trying to arrange all these tea times. Like, so I'm trying to arrange like 250 tea times. Um, and a lot of them are public, but a lot are like not public at all. And, and so I'd meet these folks who were either like could kind of be my chaperone, like knew how to get me on all the courses in Seattle or New York or wherever. And, um, and, and, and those, it was very awkward to go from say, you know, 50 email correspondents. Okay. I'm finally like, now I'm sitting in a, I'm sitting here on the golf course looking at you, right? Now you're like a real person and your emails were kind of freaking me out. Um, you were either like too excited uh, that I was coming or uh, you sounded like you didn't want me to be there at all, right? Um, and then, you know, because you're trying to like decipher who somebody is electronically is an awkward thing. And then they come to life in front of your eyes. So that was always I was like, I wonder what Dave is really like. I wonder what he looks like. Okay, now I'm about to spend three days with Dave, uh, who I don't know. Um, and 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 it turns out that you know Dave becomes one of my one of my best friends. And 
Um, that was, like I said, I was, I was ready for some real crazy people. And uh, I certainly met some eccentric people, but everyone was good. You know, I didn't meet a lot of bad hearts out there. I met one total uh, in Arizona. I met a gentleman who did not show off. He was, well, he was just a total racist and a bigot. And, uh, and, and it's, it was really difficult to be around, but in some ways I was like, you know, I grew up in a golf world where some of the more of this was tolerated. Some, not that I was glad to be hearing about any of this. In fact, I was so enraged I almost walked off the golf course, but I felt like at least this gives me the opportunity to remind people how far we've come, right? Because of the jokes this guy's telling me, like this is what I would have heard when I was a kid all the time. And now he's the exception. So that one guy stood out. But the cool thing about it was he was the only one, right? Um, you know, which, which was very, uh, it, did my, it did my heart well. I mean, so, okay, I show up in Montana, right? There's a guy I've said, I'm, I put it out on email, sorry, on Twitter, I'm going to be in Anaconda, Montana, um, not near a lot of things. And there's a golf course there, Old Works, that's built on old smelting mining and uh, so instead of cleaning it up, they just covered it with dirt and put a golf course in. Like the, the sand traps are black from, from what's left over from the mining and stuff. Um, and I show up and this guy emails me. He's like, yeah, I'm coming. I'm passing through on my way from, to my new job. And I'd love to meet up with you. I'm like, no way. Someone's going to meet me in Montana. Two other guys entered a meet. We actually ended up having a foursome. But the guy who, who uh, wonderful young man who, emailed me is like hey where are you coming from what do you do he's like oh i finished my training and i'm going off to the to the base the air force base over here i'm a missileer i'm like you're a what he's like um i'm a nuclear launch officer <laughs> like wait, 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 back up dude uh so you you turn the key he's like well i don't i'm not looking forward to it uh you know but the, yeah I, I i sit at a post and, and you know we wait for, for the call, God forbid we'd, we'd ever need it. Um, and I'm like, this is, this is just crazy. I'm in the middle of Montana and just a stranger that I'm golfing with uh, sits there essentially waiting to blow up the world. But he was, what I was relieved to find is he was very uh, level-headed. It would have been terrifying if he started like throwing clubs around and like just cursing and like breaking stuff. Be like, oh my God, he's a missile ear. But you very level tempered and great, and uh, and he gave me a military honor coin at the end from his base, and I was just like, "This is just this is awesome." I got to meet his kids. Um, just so many gifts that golf has given me, and and really, and and travel as well. Is there any golf courses that like really surprised you? Yeah. Um, there were there were surprises um, all over the place, and and some that stand out. One of the most special experiences uh, on the trip was getting to go golf in the Navajo Nation, um, which I had a lot of on my Instagram, just because it was such a to be able to play. Um, amazing men who who made the golf course happen to be welcomed in that community, um, to be made to feel so welcome. This is welcome I felt anywhere on the trip. And to see how they made golf happen in a place where it couldn't, where it shouldn't be, right? I mean, they can't grow grass uh, in the desert. And they, they, they had really like nice mud greens, like it's like dried mud. So instead of like, you have to wear golf shoes, you weren't allowed to wear golf shoes because they would break the mud right the spikes would so you had to play in sneakers and we just went around with like a pack of 12 dogs um who lived in some of the you know the people in the in the area and they were just out with us golfing in, in the desert and uh that was a you know heading out to play a golf course they call it res golf and not quite knowing where it is and, and what to expect there i mean and then finding that it's it's like the most soulful place ever um 
those days when you get those surprise days it just really lifts your spirits i mean dude playing shinnecock and national on the same day that was a good day but i wasn't surprised that it was the greatest golf day ever um but there are a few spots um uh, i mean tobacco road blew me away i i didn't everyone said oh i think you know because half the people said you'll like it half the people said you'll hate it and i just fell in love with the place um so that was just a, a, a sort of a, a wonderful surprise too um everyone loves and and rightly so and talks about sweetens cove um not too far i guess down closer to your neck of the woods and just such a special place and i absolutely love it but everyone knows about it um right up the way is the nine holer at suwanee university of the south and my gosh if like to talk about i mean my the top maybe two nine hole golf courses in america separated by 30 miles but only, everyone only goes to the one so if you're going to sweetens stop at suwanee on the way it is absolutely worth it. Um, gosh, the a uh, lot of uh, a lo lot of surprises. The book, I'm mean, honestly, every chapter is focused on the next thing that surprised me. So um, there'll be a lot for people to read about. Yeah. So speaking of subjects, what you have a subject that you've covered up to this point throughout the many years that you've been writing that you'd like another crack at or just want to kind of cover again and vice versa? Do you have a topic or subject that you haven't written on that you would like to write on in the future? Yeah. Um, I'd love to get another crack at um, doing Paper Tiger where I just got to play golf for a year and a half. That was cool. I'd like to do that again just for the hell of it because it's fun. Um, but I'd like to, uh, I'd honestly, I'm, I'd probably like to get back to writing some fiction. Um, this will be my fourth store book in a row in which I'm the main character. And um, thankfully, and hopefully, you know, an audience is still okay with that. But there would be something fun about finding a story where I, I can actually locate it from my chair versus, I know, and I know my wife would appreciate it too, versus, um, leaving for eight months uh so maybe a more stationary story there's a few people in golf about which i'd like to write a book um i'll keep them to myself because i see both of you picked up your pens ready to steal steal my next opus no I know. <laughs> um so there's a few people and i could do less of writing about me and you know spend some time writing about someone else so i think the subject of me is probably one that maybe I've taken as far as I want to in, in golf. Um, but Hey, there's always Australia, man. There's Australia out there, Australia, New Zealand, the last corner. I mean, it kind of, I like Ireland, Scotland, America is like a golf travel trilogy, but those pictures from Australia are real nice. So who knows? Yeah. I was, I was getting ready to ask you next. What's a, what's a part of the world want to spend a few weeks or a few months playing golf and I think you just answered it so well that would be the new the new spot but there's other corners like I want to go to Vietnam like in theory I want to go to Vietnam I don't want to, it's a long flight and I don't want to fly that long like I want to go to Australia but I've done that flight once and I'll never do it again but if you could teleport me to Vietnam right now to see what is uh, happening there like that in the next I guess the, maybe the cat's already the bag on it, but that's like the new hot spot for golf development. Um, they're super golf friendly. They're golf eager. Um, Greg Norman is like this golf ambassador for bringing all these, all this development to, to Vietnam. So there's like resorts and golf courses going up left and right. It's supposed to be stunningly beautiful, affordable and uh, incredibly friendly. So um, that'd be a place that, that I'd want to check out. Uh, for sure. It's a weird to say, you know, having been born in 19, I won't say I may not have been born, born during the Vietnam war. Um, in any event, we all know what it was. And to say, I want to take a golf trip to Vietnam. It's uh, it's amazing how the world has changed and, uh, and how far things have come. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, 40 odd minutes into a podcast about Oklahoma. Probably talk about Southern Hills. Yeah. Isn't this an Oklahoma pod? 
<laughs> supposed to talk about the Sooners or something. You guys going to play football or what? Fingers, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I hear you. We're in the, I'm the Notre Dame guy. I'm in the same boat. Um, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm an Arizona State guy being grown up, but it's one of those things, having, having a really fun coach and a really young quarterback who's in the Heisman talk, I, w- I want to see it. And then that's just, that's just a rolling conversation in Oklahoma about Oklahoma senior football. It's just, all right, who's, who's the quarterback? Okay, he's, how high is he in the Heisman vote? It's just, it's just getting old out here. So, well, We haven't won anything. Well, that was a fun – yeah, that was a fun thing to find in traveling through the South and, and the Plain States and um, how much SEC football and Big 12 football, it matters. You know, as a Notre Dame guy, I, football matters, right? I mean, it, we lived for it in the fall, but it's, um, it's different when you're in Mississippi and there's a game, there's an SEC game on. And, uh, you know, and, and the waitress, like, gives you, like, a 14-minute description of, like, why she's cheering for, um, you know, Florida over Kentucky because she said something about somebody else who went to Mississippi State, but she likes Old Miss. So, you know, I'm like, whoa. Like, it's like the, the battle lines are, are deep. They're complicated. People's vested interest in the game um, – are it's all it's it's awesome i i loved it i i just loved being around it uh that passion for for college football is, is just so cool so we'll see what happens yeah so you also in oklahoma the in the book is southern hills right i'm glad we did save oklahoma for the end of the podcast because it is disappointing news isn't it right you know i go to all 50 states and my time in in oklahoma was relatively short um i yeah and southern hills being a u.s open venue and one of my goals to play every u.s open venue um that's when i had to get to uh but it was at a time in the trip where it's like all right i gotta get to texas i've got it there were like so many however the route fell out and, and how, I, how i planned the route i don't i'm not even sure um a lot of like luck and guessing and and, and hope that that I'd get to all 50 states and get to all these courses, but long way of saying it is the only course that I visited, but what a course it was. It's, it's so, so good. Uh, and we just had an absolute blast. I played it with Colton Craig, who's a young architect and who's a Perry Maxwell nut. And, and so Southern Hills being a Perry Maxwell course, um, and it also having been, you know, uh, Gil Hands uh, having done recent upgrades there. Um, it's just a fun park and it's beautiful. And you pull up and that beautiful the towers there and the whole thing. And um, I mean, sometimes you go to these clubs that have big reputations and especially as like a Yankee and you're like, I'm going to the, you know, I'm out of my comfort zone or whatever. And you're, you wonder how you're going to be treated or if you're going to make a mistake or if you're going to violate some sort of etiquette. Southern Hills, man, was like wide open arms. It was just hospitality, and we're glad to see you and glad to have you. I just felt so good there. Then we went downtown like, somewhere in Tulsa for uh, Mexican food with the Perry Maxwell Society. So I had dinner with the Perry Maxwell Society, which is actually more fun than it sounds. Yeah, it sounds awful. <laughs> I mean, they're not – it does, doesn't it? I mean, they're not a bunch of party animals. Um, let's, let's get it clear. But uh, they were pretty nice guys. And – Half the room, I think, was wondering how they – the biggest topic of the conversation was how did I end up in the Perry Maxwell Society? But um, Colton is passionate, and there are other Perry Maxwell guys as, as well who are just as passionate. So it's cool to see them, and we, had, you know, we actually had a lot of fun. But, you know, I remember jumped in the car, and where was I going? I think I was going to Texas. So, yeah. Whoosh. Yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, Tulsa – Tulsa is one of those ones, especially Southern Hills. How was the what, what time of year did you play, and how was the weather when you played? Played it in the fall, and um, it was nice uh, early fall. So I'd like to say September. It's all a blur, man. <laughs> I gotta look at my calendar, um, but I don't remember being cold. 
so uh the, yeah we got a nice we got a bluebird day actually yeah 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 um go ahead september's september's one of the months where you you get weather i've i was fortunate to play play a tournament at southern hills in october it's the only time i've been able to play it. and it was a 30 sit well it was a two wave event you had a wave of people playing in the morning then you had another wave playing in the afternoon it was i think degrees and it was raining so hard they canceled the afternoon wave but luckily i was in the morning wave well uh, luckily i was in the morning wave so i played it absolutely miserable but there's just there's something about playing a u.s open course but specifically playing a perry max course it's just the challenge is fun and i think that was the only thing that was able to keep keep me to get some stand the most slopes because they're pretty unforgiving yeah but yeah it's just like another one like you said an old u.s open classic they make you think right um they they make you uh they you know whether it be southern hills oakmont Shock, go in and say oh most people will never get to play so you're kind of like all right well let's say something about them to, you know that will not make someone feel badly about not being able to play there. But you walk out and you're like, it's just so good. And Southern Hills was like that, you know, just and not just because they're hard, but more just because you're, you're so engaged the entire time. And that's what classic designers did so well in the way that they use topography and the way that they use slopes. Um, and that the, and that those updaters like Gil hands and Andrew green and Silva and those guys have brought back, um, all that stuff to, to, you know, just really make you think yourself your way around the golf course. It's the really, you just feel totally invested in everything you're doing out there. And, and Southern Hills was, was like that and just super fun. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll go a few more. Uh, what's the most underrated golf region? Underrated golf region? I'm going to go with, I mean, people have certainly discovered it. But there's two that are just killer um, that people don't, you know, everyone goes to Florida, you know, everyone knows about Monterey. Um, Wisconsin is aces because you've got this little triangle. I mean, Sand Valley, Mike Kaiser's place is, is getting a lot of publicity and as it should, it's so good. But then you combine that with Aaron Hills, uh, a public course called Lasonia. Um, which Andy Johnson of the fried egg kind of put on the map. And um, it's also so good. Uh, and some whistling straights, if you got the budget. Um, I mean, there's mind blowing golf holes out there for sure. Um, and you can just have a killer Wisconsin golf trip and not drive more than an hour. The season's short. That's, that's an issue. And the same thing is in for the St. Paul, Minnesota area. They have great golf courses up there more invitations to play golf in Minnesota than anywhere else. And, uh, you know, interlocking and, and, and some of the public courses as well, just, they're just so, so good. The Hazel team. Um, but again, you know, like how you can only play from, I guess, May to September, but they're so, when they do get outside, they're so passionate and, and into their sports. Um, it's just awesome. So I love those spots, but Nebraska is, um, for me between like the prairie club and sand hills nebraska has this geological miracle in it that it has as much lynx land as all of ireland and scotland like the total area of ireland and scotland you could fit inside the sand hills of nebraska so they just have like perfect golf condition out there of course it's so so remote can you get there? How do you get there, etc. But they did when they built Sand Hills out there, so the golf course, and uh, that's it's pretty special. Uh, what about the best bar and grill? The best nineteenth hole, you say? Um, oh, that's a good one. The uh, let's see, what was the best hang? There's a lot of good hangs. Um, well, I mean, clubhouse wise, it wouldn't really be bar and grill having lunch at national golf links 
was the best sort of golf food experience I've ever had. Um, it's kind of a famous lunch where you go and you put a jacket on and, you know, it's right next to Shinnecock and, um, and the golf course itself is, is you know, legendary and, and they bring you lobster. And the funny thing was like, they brought out the lobsters and I gobbled the lobsters down. And then the waiter comes over and he's like, what would you like for lunch? I'm like, Whoa, I, I just ate, I just ate a lobster, man. And he's like, no, it's, you know, it's just a, like, it's an amuse-bouche. Yeah. Um, snacks? Now I order, for, now, yeah, now I'm going to eat the crab cake. And, the, and I was like sick the whole afternoon because I don't ever eat that much. But a um, lot of strong golf hangs. Uh, the Cal Club had a cool vibe to it. Um, Garden City, just for like a straight up fraternity, Garden City Men's Club in New York. Um, dude. I mean, you don't have to, like, you got to wear a jacket, but you don't have to wear pants. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's like, you'll see dudes in there and they're boxers with a jacket on, like eating breakfast or something. It's, it's about as men's club as it gets, whether, and whether that's your thing or not. And I, I try to be honest about it in the book that, that how I, how I, you know, feel about those kind of old institutions. Um, but it's incredibly uh, cool that, that, like going into a room like that, just like, whoa, it's like you're on another planet. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of good ones. Dress code basically just show up, show up with what you woke up with, and it's yeah. on pants on, you just walk right in, but you got a blazer on. Yeah, yeah, there was a story in the book that where someone told me about, well, you know what. I don't even know if it's going to end up in a book and it might get the guy in trouble. So I'll leave that out. But to, to, uh, suffice to say, you literally can get away with just wearing a jacket. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so that, that's, that's, uh, yeah. I can, I can only imagine some of those are making the cut. How, um, how, how, how do you find it balancing teaching at St. Joseph's and writing but also taking these kind of extended trips to write do you kind of do it when there's a break in school or you say hey i'm not teaching this semester and then just kind of move along how how do you balance that yeah it's been you know with scotland that was a more compact sort of trip i was able to do that over a, a summer break um and then i used a sabbatical to do the do the writing and and the promotion um it's, it's a hard balance to strike, but St. Joe's is, is really supportive um, in terms of my books and my writing. So leave to do the traveling and I've been on research leave ever since because I needed the time to write the book. Um, I'm taking all as well because uh, I will be doing all the edits on the book. Um, the COVID situation doesn't make me want to like run back. Um, cause I think we're all trying to figure out school is going to operate. So it's actually been a convenient time to be away from, from the teaching, but it is a juggling act. And, um, thankfully I have the university support. Um, I'm fortunate to have tenure there and not that I abuse it by like not showing up to teach because when I'm not, it works out for everybody. Um, it's not like I'm taking a salary and then going golfing. Uh, but they understand when I have to go often do something like this because I teach writing and, and I teach writing from the point of view of someone who writes. And so my doing, um, it makes me a better teacher and I, they get that. So that's great. Yeah. I guess to piggyback on that too, um, you did the uh, trap draw a while back. Have Neil and Rand came in, audited one of your classes yet? I know <laughs> fitting in on one of those, but... They have not. No, I'll tell you. And I would love they could come visit. In fact, I mean, they would be good instructors, I think, to come into um, at least for like to talk about. Well, one, Randy is really bookish um, and, and super smart. And though even though Neil like plays the uh, sort of the jester right in, in their uh, in their scenarios, he might be the smartest of the group. Um, he's he's got a sort of mad genius going on. Uh, you get into, you can get into some pretty intense conversations with him and, and he knows his stuff and, and he'll throw it at you fast. And, and they're all just a really a bright group of guys. So I'd love to have them come and actually didn't come in to teach for me. The students would love to hear about their experience, the whole thing of how no laying up has happened and 
how they create content and they're storytellers too. You know, they're, they're very good storytellers. So even though it's a different medium, um, yeah, I don't want them in the back of my classroom distracting <laughs> me. I'd rather have, they can, come, they can come sit up front. Yeah. Um, with, you know, doing all this golf travel and, and seeing everything yeah. home in the UK and just seeing how it, how it is and how friendly everybody is. And just, it's just total love of the game. And there's no real, like, it's not super, like you were saying earlier, it's not like the country club vibe here. It's super easy to get on. If you want to go play St. Andrews or wherever you can get on, you just have to pay, you know, it's real relatively not expensive. How, after right. states for eight months and traveling around the states what's your view on the future of golf now yeah so i mean it's an argument that i do get into the book a few times in fact so many times that i feel like my editor will probably make me cut a couple because i don't want to hit that note too many times as we're in the editing process and that note being there's another way to do it right and 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 it's right there. It's in the home of golf. It's where it started that, you know, visitor friendly clubs exist all over the UK and Ireland and they do just fine. And not only do they do fine, they thrive because they're, you know, if you're going to have put aside, you know, whatever, 12, 20 tee times a day for visitors for Americans who are willing to come pay 300 euro or something you know that underwrites everyone else's you know uh yearly dues so it keeps the golf visitor golf helps you know helps your numbers so it just makes a lot of like financial sense if there's some you know why we can't have visitors at our clubs uh you know who'd be willing to pay whatever or you use a lottery system of sorts so that you don't have the same people coming all the time or whatever i mean there's i think there'd be ways to do it right um it would be nice to see us adopt that more European model, I think, where you're deciding a golf course is great because you've played it and you've seen it, and you're not thinking a golf course is great because you can't get on it. Um, you know, where we connect exclusivity and excellence, um, you know, there's the courses and, you know, Bally Bunyan's not hiding, you know, uh, where you know they're ranked top royal dornick is ranked you know has been ranked tops in the world and they're not hiding come come play our course see how great it is and i'm not saying the great courses here are hiding i'm just saying that they're organized in a way that like you could get more people out there um not and again it's not their responsibility to do that but um after seeing what it, how much great golf community there is out there how many people love the game how many people would love to have these opportunities the opportunities that i had last year um and wanting to share them with other people i can only share them through the page is, is how i can share those experiences the flip side of that is you know what's cool about playing pine valley in cyprus it's because it's hard to do it's hard to get on you know right it's part of the it's also part of the fun so it gets it cuts both ways but I, there you go. Exactly. The Pine Valley hat. So, and you know, what's interesting. Yes. Yeah, so Mike is showing off his Pine Valley hat. And if I know you're, you know how I know you're not a member, Mike, because your hat says Pine Valley. on. Exactly. And there's a members that's, there's a, a members pro shop upstairs yeah. in the locker room yeah. where you, if you're a member, you just get the logo and that kills me. Cause I'm in Philadelphia. Right. So yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. It's a small little, like doorway but you know you're in philadelphia so there be like pine you know there's some pine valley members around here pine valley's 30 minutes away and uh and you'll see the guys that just have the shield and you're like oh you screw you <laughs> and then the guy and you see the guy with like it says pine valley and you're like don't be a loser don't wear that it's like screaming like i got on some yeah. you know i begged someone to take me to pine valley yeah. so it's like man don't have a member's logo but i guess it's kind of cool but anyway it's a tough one. I, I just do like the fact that when I go to Ireland and Scotland, I can play anywhere I want. Not because I'm a golf writer, um, but because I know how to pick up a phone or <laughs> fill out a form online and go play. You know, let the clubs be exclusive. I don't have to go in your locker room. You know, the best, this was a cool setup that they had down um, in South Carolina. 
at um, at Yemen's Hall, right? So in the sum, and Yemen's Hall probably couldn't be more exclusive. You know, one of the most exclusive spots in the world. I mean, Rockefellers and Carnegies and like it's it's old, 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 old money. Like a place they would stop and hang out on the way down to their Florida estates. And and those families still go back there, the Kellogg's and stuff like that. Like America's founding industrial families. When they're not using it in the summertime, not there, they open it up to locals who can join for, you know, a, 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 a relatively very affordable fee. And they can't go in the clubhouse. They have their own little bar next in the pro shop and, they, and they're happy as hell. You know, I don't need to go in your fancy clubhouse. I won't touch your locker room. It's all good. Just, you know, it'd be nice if, if we'd share the first tea with each other, like they do at St. Andrews, like they do at Carnoustie, like they do at Dornick, like they do at Ballet Bunyan. So I don't know, maybe something will change. So when, when was the last time that you played golf and how, how's your golf game right now? Probably should have led with this. Just remember. No, I, I, uh, the last time, well, it's Tuesday. So I can't play on Mondays. Uh, scores are closed here. So Sunday, um, I play a lot still. Um, couldn't play today. I can only hit balls today, but I'm playing tomorrow, playing Thursday, playing Friday, <laughs> playing, playing Saturday. <laughs> and then that brings us back to Sunday. So, I mean, what the hell else are you going to do, man? It's Corona. Yeah. You got to golf. Get out there. Um, I'm playing all right. You know, I'm always working on something. And so I was at the gym today trying to work, working on that posture. I'm not as flexible as I used to be. My hips aren't as loose as I want them to be. So I'm working on that. And uh, my handicap right now is a uh, 2.5 index. So um, mid seventies is where I'm generally shooting. So uh, room for improvement, but I've also been worse. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your time. Um, thanks for asking our questions and talking a little bit about uh, Southern Hills and Oklahoma. Um, so the book is coming out spring 2021, um, and you can go to the website, tomcoin.com, and CoinWriter, is it on Instagram? Yeah, Instagram and Twitter, uh, CoinWriter, C-O-Y-N-E, Writer. You can come follow the adventures there. I'm still going to some interesting places, even though we're not traveling as much as we used to, but uh, lots of stories there. And you can check out Links Life on YouTube as well. Awesome. Everyone listening, I'll post all those links down below so you can click on those. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can go straight to Tom's channel and watch the Links Life videos. Very, very entertaining. Uh, Tom, really appreciate your time. And for everyone listening, we will catch you next week. Thanks so much. Cheers. Mike and Blake, thanks so much, guys. Hi to everyone in Oklahoma. Thank you.